Tonight on Huckabee, U.S. Senator from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham. Crack up comedy with David Kay. Vintage guitar expert, Willie Mosley. Christian rock band, Love Song. Stray Corley of the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Keith Filbury. And now, here's Mike Huckabee! Wow. What a great audience we've got here. And we're so thrilled that you are here because it has been a crazy week right here in a place we once knew as America. Yep, on Monday, President Biden hosted a freak show, otherwise known as Pride Day at the White House, where he called boys pretending to be girls the most courageous people he's ever known. Now, this was days after most of America soberly remembered the real courage of those young men who stormed the beaches of Normandy at D-Day to help save the world from maniacal dictators like Hitler, who murdered 11 million people, 6 million just because they were Jews. In Joe's weird world, he thinks that having a man who had surgical breast implants and then stripped topless on the very grounds of the White House, cavorting along with some other depraved people in various stages of undress, was what real courage looked like. Well, not me, Joe. I didn't see courage. I saw the result of people like you calling evil good. And that ain't courage. It's craziness. It is the celebration of sin. Now, on Flag Day, the flag that flew most prominently at the White House was not the American flag, but the so-called pride flag that celebrates the LGBTQIA plus kingdom or we might as well call it the LGBTQIA plus EIEIO flag. <laughs> yes, the People's House is currently occupied by a man who believes that biological men ought to take the place of biological women in sports in order to win contests that they aren't man enough to win as men. Now, we saw... We saw the U.S. flag fly at the same level, but less prominently as the flag of the rainbow colors of the pride that has replaced decency. But as the Bible says, pride goeth before a fall. I'm not yet sure if this insanity masquerading as tolerance and diversity will fall, or if it'll be the very nation that has embraced deviant behavior as normal. The radicals have co-opted the beauty of the rainbow, which has historically stood for God's promise to Noah to not destroy the earth by water again. They've turned it into a rallying symbol for mocking marriage and holiness and lifting up the kind of actions described in Romans chapter 1 as having been given over to shameful lust where God gave them over to a depraved mind. Pray to God. You're some of the most, you're some of the bravest and most inspiring people I've ever known. And I've known a lot of good folks. You set an example for the nation and, quite frankly, for the world. Well, the people who undressed on the lawn of the White House after being lauded by President Biden for being so courageous and who disgraced the visit with their selfish, childish, and licentious display were later said to be disinvited to future White House events for their outrageous behavior. Here's my question for President Biden. Why did you ever invite them in the first place and then go out of your way to say that they were more courageous than Navy SEALs who risked their lives in every mission? Or firefighters who rush into burning houses to save children? Or policemen who risk getting shot every time they answer a call? Or Coast Guardsmen who venture into the weather that everybody else is getting away from? Or Navy pilots who fly jet fighters onto little slivers of metal called aircraft carriers in the middle of a raging ocean. I mean, do you honestly think that a man with all the physical attributes of a man who puts on a dress has more courage than the Secret Service agent who walks alongside Joe Biden ready to take a bullet? 
I mean, is the man who outrageously dresses up in a woman's clothing and then reads pornographic stories to little children in a public library, is that really more courageous than a nurse who goes into an IC ward to treat a patient who has a deadly and highly infectious disease? Sorry, Joe, but you and I have different standards of courage. In fact, we've got different standards for marriage, the sanctity of human life, and the role of men and women. And for that matter, we've got different standards for simple right and wrong when it comes to believing that only certain people in specific political parties are protected from being prosecuted for wrongdoing, while your political opponents are targeted for relentless persecution because apparently you don't think you can win a fair and honest election. So I'm going to do all I can, and I hope other Americans will join me in making sure that you get sent back to Delaware in two years. And when you get there, you can stack all kinds of boxes of material in your garage right next to your Corvette, and you can eat all the ice cream you want, because I want our country to return to believing that the real heroes are the people who protect us from evil, not the ones who parade evil in our very faces. Senator Lindsey Graham has represented South Carolina in the United States Senate for more than 20 years. He is a military veteran and has made a real name for himself in the Senate as a conservative problem solver and a staunch defender of American interest at home and all over the world. A great friend of Israel as well and one of its champions, one of the reasons I really respect him. Would you please welcome to our show in Nashville for the first time, U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham. <laughs> Senator, great to have wow. you here. Wow. You know, there's been a little thing going on in Washington this week. It's been kind of crazy. Do you sometimes just feel glad to get away from there and come to Oh, a- like every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm heading the right direction when I get to Nashville and South Carolina. But that was really good, Mike. Uh, how about a round of applause for a guy that stands up? Uh, tells it like it is. Well, thank you. So I do this for a living. This is the best food I've ever had on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, know who does it, but hats off to him. You and I have been friends a long time. And one of the reasons that We're I think we old. have. We are. <laughs> We're getting old. But, you know, we have a common interest for one thing. We are strong believers that Israel is the most important part of the Middle East and brings stability to the rest of the region. Um, What's happening there now? And are we going to be able to see progress from the Abraham Accords that that happened before? Well, let's start with the idea that Israel's a friend. How about that? Yes, it is. Absolutely. (laughs) So uh, it's a democracy, common values and common enemies. I can't think of any group that wants to destroy Israel that doesn't want to kill us too. That's a good point, and it's very true. (laughs) And uh, they've been a great friend. They give us a lot of intelligence about what the bad guys are up to. And uh, the Abraham Accords was an effort by President Donald J. Trump. Yep. Remember that name? Yep. Uh, Who turned the Mideast upside down in the right way. You had a, a group of Arab countries recognize Israel as a one and only Jewish state. And uh, there's an effort by President Biden that me and you're going to help him. We don't agree with him on most things. But it'd be nice if Saudi Arabia and Israel would come together, wouldn't it? It would be. That would be the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's possible, but it was only possible because of the Abraham Accords. What President Trump did, he went into the Mideast and says, I'm a friend of Israel, and if you don't like it, too bad. Yeah. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Every politician said it. Trump did it. He actually moved the embassy. I was there with you. I was there, and it was it was surreal. After all the years of people promising, believe it. he just went and did it. And Senator, two weeks <laughs> after that happened, I was having a meeting with him in the White House. I'll never forget. I said, yeah. Mr. President, everybody told you not to do it. Yeah. Everyone said yeah. not to do it. You did it anyway. Why? Right. I'll never forget. He said, well, I said I was going to do it, and it was the right thing to do. End of story. And I thought, how refreshing for an executive just to say, I said I was going to do it, so I did it. And it was the right thing to do. And that's all he had to have. And, you know, if you got a problem with Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, take it up with God. Yeah. <laughs> He's the guy did it. Well, that's a good point because he was the, He's the guy one who put it that way. Yeah. 
Senator, you were one of the Republicans that voted against the debt ceiling, and yeah. uh, there were a lot of the conservatives who did. Your reasons for saying it's just not what I'm going to say. Well, the number one job of the federal government is to defend the nation, right? Yeah. Uh, we got 50 states. Uh, I think the state should do most things, but you need Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, all that good stuff that you're talking about, the real heroes. Yep. Well, this budget we got is 2% below inflation. How many of you think China's uh, somebody we ought to be worried about? Yep. Me. Yeah, amen. You bet. If you ain't worried about them, you shouldn't be on watching this. Show. <laughs> so, because you should go get some help. Uh, China's an enemy. Yeah. This budget takes the Navy from 298 ships to 291. The Chinese are going from 300 to 450 in a decade. So it's just inadequate to the threats we face. So that's why I voted no. I've tried to be consistent since I've been there. If you don't get national security right, there is nothing else going to matter. How many of you are on Social Security like me? <laughs> well, that only works if you're free. Yeah. And you can live free. And how many of you go to church every Sunday and sometimes on Wednesday? Yeah. That only works in places like this. It doesn't work in China. So if you want to be free, somebody's got to pay the price. Well, and you served in the military. You were a member of the JAG Corps. You yeah. Were active duty and then for a long time in the reserves. Yeah. So I know it's something that you understand firsthand. Are we seeing, however, in the military, a level of wokeism that is not about national security, but it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion more so than it is lethality of our forces? So I had the Secretary of Army over and I said, I hear you're falling short in recruiting. Yeah, we are. Have you ever wondered why? <laughs> Let me tell you why. There are a lot of people in the military, you know, have young people, have military family, and it's changed way too much. You know, the military is paying for people to go get abortions. Hmm. You know, I think there was 20 in the history in the last few years. Now there are 4,000 uh, abortions where people are given money or paid leave to go have an abortion. That's not what the military is about, right? Yeah. No. The military is about bringing us all together. Black, white, rich, poor, doesn't matter where you come from. You put on the uniform, you're an American, and you go defend us all. Well, that's not being done now. It's about dividing us. It's about celebrating our differences rather than what we have in common. So that's why people are not joining. And I can't wait to 2024 to fire this crowd. Yeah. Get them out of town. <laughs> Run them out. I, I hope people understand that is the power of, a, of an American citizen. Ultimately, people answer to the voters. Right. But if we don't vote, nothing changes. Well, I tell you what, you know, vote by mail, crawl to vote, take a plane, whatever it takes to get you to vote. But we got to start voting earlier because by election day, we're so far behind. But uh, God help us if we lose another election, okay? Yeah. I'm for Trump. I don't know who you're for. I'm for Trump. We got I a lot of good very choices vocal on about the Republican it. side, right? <laughs> and, um, it doesn't have to be this way, Mike. Yeah. You don't have to live this way. Yeah. Trump showed us how to secure the border, right? Yeah. He yes, stood he up to the terrorists. Yeah. He killed the bad guys and he stood by the good guys. We had lower inflation. We were energy independent. And you can get back to that only if you choose to get to America. You better wake up. You well, better get involved and you better show up. There's a lot of things happening to, uh, to Donald Trump, a lot of things <laughs> happening this week. I want to get into that with you, but we've got to take a break. We've got a whole lot more to cover with Senator Lindsey Graham. Don't go away. We will be right back. Still to come, laughs with comedian David Gaines and later love song performs. You're watching Huckabee. and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at Gov Mike Huckabee on Twitter. Welcome back. We are visiting with Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. Senator, this week has been, in a way, just beyond even <laughs> comprehension. Yeah. A former president 
and the current leading candidate by a mile in the Republican primary, right. the likely opponent to the sitting president, <clears throat> right. was indicted and arrested by the current president's Justice Department yeah. in an attempt to make sure that he can't be president. All, all you're missing is the bananas. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it feels like that. I mean, this is the kind of thing that happens in some South American dictatorship. <laughs> totally. Nope. Well, you know, we're going to punch through all this. Stick with Trump, okay? Just stick with him. You know, we're going to punch through this. Let's, speaking of Trump, you ran for president. Yes. You actually got votes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you were the last guy standing against John McCain. I, I remember that. You're a really good politician. You know who you are and you know what you believe. But Mike was one of the 16 people who ran against Trump, including me. Yeah. And if you don't remember me, it's not your fault I didn't last that long. So <laughs> None of us did. I called him every name you could call him on legally on the air. And he won, and he called me up said, I'd like you to help me. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, he's the president. And people ask, what happened with you and Trump? Well, I found common ground with the president. Yeah. Yeah, I come to like him, and he likes him. <laughs> and that gives us around the golf course. <laughs> I've never seen anybody in politics who can take blow after blow after blow to the head <laughs> yes. and get up off the canvas and go back and put some more punches out there. So why do they hate him and fear him so much? Because they know what he can do if he gets the job. If you're pro-life, yeah. if you believe in owning a gun responsibly, if you believe in limited government, you believe boys shouldn't play in girls' sports, then you're an enemy of the people. Yeah. It really ain't about Trump. It's about all of us. You know, when my friend John McCain won, he was the crazy old guy. Romney was the guy who put his dog on top of the car, you know, mean-hearted billionaire. If you're a Republican, you could have the Dalai Lama win the nomination. They'd go after him. Yeah. But what they hate most about Trump is he can connect with people that no other Republican's done since Ronald Reagan. And that's why they're trying to destroy this guy. And it's not gonna work. We live in a country, if you're the Secretary of State running for president, you can take a hammer to a cell phone and you can wipe emails clean and nothing happens to you. Nothing. Nothing. So it's not right and we're gonna fix it in 2024. And if Trump gets the nomination, he's gonna win because he can look the camera and eye and say, remember when I was president? Remember how you felt about your country? Remember when the border was secure? When I had the cops back, not the crooks back? Remember when I took on the terrorists and killed them before they could kill you? Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, and and gasoline was a lot cheaper. Yeah, groceries you could were cheaper. Afford to drive. Right now, you have to take a mortgage on you, you know, to fill up your car to go fill up gas, and you probably get robbed when you get at the gas station. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. Washington has also been rocked by the revelation from the whistleblower. Yeah. That there are credible sources of evidence, not just hearsay, yeah. that the Biden family took millions of dollars. Now James Comer from Kentucky, head of the Oversight Committee, says it could be to 20 to $30 million from foreign governments to influence policy. Senator... That's one of the most scandalous things, but the press is ignoring it. Well, the, well, you know, listen, if you're looking for the press to tell you anything about a Democrat, you, you, need, you need dogs to find the truth. The bottom line is, um, I don't know what happened, but we're going to look into it. I'm not going to do what they did. I'm not going to take something and run with it knowing it's not true or it may not be true. Two wrongs don't make a right. But I do know that Hunter Biden took money from Burisma, the largest oil uh, gas company in Ukraine, one of the most corrupt places in the world. He was on their board. Why? Because he was Hunter Biden. And if it had been Don Jr., it had been all over the newspaper oh, yeah. and he'd be in jail. But now that's the world we live in, right? Yeah. Well, we're going to fix that world come 2024. Well, let's hope we do. Senator, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you here. Thank you. It's an honor. I appreciate your friendship. I hope you'll come back and be on the show again. You need to come here. If you're watching, this is a ton of fun. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Thank you. If you want to follow the senator on social media, you go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you with Senator Lindsey Graham and all the work that he's doing, not just for the people of South Carolina, but for you as well. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is standing by. He's going to tell you what we got coming up next, and it's good. Well, be prepared to laugh. Comedian David Kay is next on Huckabee.
Welcome back, everybody. We got David Kay here tonight. He spent the first half of his career at comedy clubs and colleges, but more recently, he's focused on his funny fundraiser events. He's raised nearly $3 million for churches and all kinds of nonprofit groups. His first dry bar comedy special called Time Out of My Mind is in the top 10 of the dry bar app. Making his network TV debut, would you please give a great big Huckabee Show welcome to Mr. David Kay. Well, hello, Nashville. It is great to be here with you. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, before I get things started, Governor, I want, to, uh, I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. Thank you. And to all those folks here in the audience who are also celebrating, happy Father's Day to you. So I hope, you, uh, I hope it's wonderful for you. Unfortunately for me, I lost my father long ago. I was only 14 when my father passed. And it wasn't long after my father uh, passed, my mother turned to me and said, she, she said, you know, David, now that your father is gone, you are the man of the house. You're going to have to step into his shoes, do the things that he used to do. So I started making moonshine and cussing out the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, they were great. Uh, my, my parents were great people. I, I really loved them. Uh, they met the old-fashioned way. Not like me. Uh, I met my current wife online through a dating website for singles over 50 called Our Time. And I'm glad we didn't wait because they have one for people 65 and over. It's called Time's a Wasting. <laughs> yeah, they actually have one for people 80 and over. It's called Time's Up. That's it. You have no more time left. Yeah, let's, let's be honest, folks. If you're still single and you're 80, it really was you after all. <laughs> but uh, it was weird finding her online. She met me first. She found me first on the internet, scoured the internet, and finally settled on me. Like I'm a cheap hotel room on Priceline. That's how that was. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was the love of her life. Turned out all she was looking for was a place that accepted pets and had free Wi-Fi. I know, there was no romantic proposal. She just added me to her cart. <laughs> I think she had a, cu a coupon or a Groupon. Well, there was a promo code involved. I know that. So. But uh, it was funny when my wife's uh, mother found out that we were getting married, she was so thrilled that, my, that her daughter was going to marry a stand-up comedian that she sold her house in Vermont and moved all the way down to where we live in Pittsburgh. And so uh, just this past spring, my wife's uh, brother also lived in Vermont. He decided to move down to Pittsburgh. So next month, uh, we're moving to Vermont. <laughs> I, think I think that's the right thing to do. The one thing you have to have in, uh, in common, you have to have things in common if you want to have a joyful marriage. That's what I found out. You have to, be, you have, to have a lot in common. We do have a lot in common. Uh, my wife and I both love to travel. We both love blues music and we both have a CPAP machine. Isn't that awesome? Anybody else have a CPAP machine, can't breathe at night? Yeah, if you have no idea what a CPAP machine is, it's this medical apparatus that you strap onto your face when you go to bed at night. It blows air into your lungs while you're sleeping because you are too weak and pathetic as a human being to stay alive while you're in a state of unconsciousness. God forbid the electricity goes off at our house. <laughs> or we ever decide to go on a camping trip. <laughs> I'll have to hire a trail guide with a bicycle pump. <laughs> hey, buddy, you okay? You okay? Hey, buddy, all right? He's not breathing. He's not breathing. It's the tire pump. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous. We put these masks on at night. It's like, good night, honey. Good night, honey. It's like Top Gun in our bedroom every night. I know it's like I feel the need, the need to breathe. I know it's ridiculous. And people say, Dave, why would you, a good-looking strapping fellow like yourself? need a CPAP machine, and I'll tell you why. I've got something called sleep apnea, and the way that works for me when I fall asleep, usually on my back, my soft palate relaxes, closes down on my 
baby-like air passage, and I stop breathing. And after about 10 seconds of this, my brain is like, hello, could you send some oxygen up here? Yeah, suddenly my brain sounds like Bernie Sanders for some reason. We need bigger infrastructure in your throat, universal health care, and why am I not president? I don't know, Bernie. Ask the governor. <laughs> Sends down chemicals, wakes me up. Now, if you still don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to do an impression for you of what sleep apnea sounds like. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit down right here, I'm gonna do my impression, and you can go ahead and clap when you hear it. So here we go, folks. My impression, sleep apnea. Clap when you hear it. Here we go. Sleep apnea. Take one. Here we go. <laughs> oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait. That, that's just snoring. That was just snoring. That was just snoring. God, I love your enthusiasm, though. <laughs> but you're swinging at the ball before the pitch has been thrown. So. Let's try that one again. How about that? So, we're gonna try that again. Now, sleep apnea, take two. Here we go. Sleep apnea, take two. Here we go. Clap in here. If you know somebody that sleeps like that, you better get them a CPAP machine or it won't be long until their time is up. <laughs> and that's my time, folks. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh. Thank you, David. Burks. Great having you Thank here. Thank you very much, Governor. That's awesome. Thank you. Too many of us know those folks who have uh, gone through all that stuff. Hey, look, if you want to see David Kay's hilarious dry bar comedy special, Time Out of My Mind, or if you'd like to book one of his funny fundraisers, which I think is a brilliant idea, you can do it for your church or your nonprofit. What a great way to raise money and have fun doing it. Go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you to David Kay. Now, Keith Bilbrey is practically out of his own mind, but he's really wanting to tell you what's coming up next, so we're going to let him do it. Go ahead, Keith. All right. After the break, it's all guitar talk with Willie G. Mosley. And later, the iconic Christian group Love Song is here. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. And by the way, if you're wondering why this audience is clapping, part of it is because they're having a great time listening to the greatest band in America, Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. All the good reason that you should come and be part of our studio audience sometime soon. Well, this next segment is something that is very special to me. Willie G. Mosley is the senior writer for Vintage Guitar Magazine and news editor emeritus for the Tallahassee Tribune. He's also the author of 15 books, and I guarantee you that his latest is his best yet. Why? Because it's called Basses and Guitars, The Huckabee Collection. Please welcome Willie G. Mosley. Willie, great having you here, my friend. This has been an exciting thing. I didn't write the book. I just got to watch you put this book together. It's a collection of photos and stories of the guitars that I've been collecting for 50 years. I consider this to have been a collaboration, though, even though I handled the text part and the photo part. Well, it was so much fun. You taught me things about the guitars that I have owned that I just simply did not know, the technical stuff. But you delved into the stories, which I think is what makes the book fun, even if you're not a guitar player. Well, it, it was the thing about doing the research a lot of your guitars, you know, are American-made, and American-made guitars are only about 10% of the market now. But it's a lot of fun doing research going that far back, and the definitive example is your Pencrest 1580. Yeah. It was your very first uh, electric guitar. Going through those old catalogs, uh, Penny, Sears, Montgomery Ward, Spiegel, even Western Auto ads sometimes. Yeah. 
That's a time warp and a nostalgia trip, and it certainly was enjoyable. And, and most of us uh, who are this age, the baby boomers, Beatles were the ones who turned us on to music. And we all wanted to be the fifth Beatle. I certainly did. I don't know why I never made it, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> but I wanted an electric guitar, and we all had to have guitars. Now we're at the age where we're we want to collect those guitars that we never could afford when we were teenagers. So vintage guitar as an industry is huge. It's uh, time warp type stuff for us. They're time warp machines for people like you and me. The Beatles on Ed Sullivan was, that did it for a lot of people, particularly wimps like me. It was, for me, it was, uh, uh, you know, wow, here's a, a way to meet girls besides being a jock. You could uh, play in a band. <laughs> And we took advantage of that as much as we could. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you as far as getting into bands and, and trying to, because seeing that and hearing that performance on Ed Sullivan was uh, an eye-opening experience and an ear-opening experience. Because you mm. never got, forgot the sound of those screaming teenage. Uh, Absolutely. Girls. And they, a lot of us are caught, like I said, in, a, in sort of a, a time warp. I'll be 73 years old next month, and I'm still trying to figure out the real words to Louie Louie. <laughs> <laughs> we all are, Willie. We all are. We brought three of the guitars that are in the book and in my collection uh, that I keep here in Nashville. I think there's like 70 guitars or 70-something in the whole collection that all of them are here and pictures and stuff. But let's talk about people see me play the Rickenbacker, that red bass guitar. I play it most of the time when I'm playing on the show. And that's a fun guitar to play. Well, the three that you have there are sort of a microcosm of how bass, uh, electric bass has evolved since the first one was production successful model was the Fender Precision reduced in, I mean, introduced in 1951. But uh, the Rickenbacker, well, and by the way, this is your free sample chapter, ladies and gentlemen, because there's a separate chapter on those three utility instruments right there. But the Rickenbacker was also a, a California product that came around in the, in the 50s. And it was a little bit unique because it's what's called a neck through instrument. The bass neck and the middle of the body are all, all one contiguous piece of wood. And the sides of the body are glued onto it like wings. That gives it a piano-like sound, almost, uh, particularly if you're using a, a, a pick with, with, that, with that particular model. And, you nailed it, Governor, when you said in the book, you know, that nothing else sounds like them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty special. The one in the middle is uh, a Tobias bass made here in Nashville at the Gibson Cup Custom Shop several years ago. CEO at the time, Henry Juskowitz, presented that guitar to me. I was the only sitting governor in America that was playing bass guitar in a rock and roll band. He thought I ought to be playing one of his instruments, so he presented that one to me. And it's been fun. Tobias is a, is a brand that exemplifies how the bass evolved over the, uh, the last few decades. It was founded in 1977, and uh, Gibson bought Tobias in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also a neck-through instrument, but it's got uh, several layers of walnut and purple heart wood, and that is a figured maple cap on either side of, of the body. Now, that also has something called active electronics, which is... A, battery-powered circuitry that's on the inside that helps you enhance your tones a little bit better, help you sound even better. We're going to run out of time. I just want to mention quickly, that third guitar is one that was handmade, and it was uh, custom-made by Pat Williams in California. He makes all the guitars for Peter Cetera, formerly of Chicago. And uh, Peter Cetera saw me play on the Jay Leno show with Kevin Eubanks in the band, thought I did okay, and had Pat Williams make that guitar for me. So that's a very special precious instrument. And those kind of stories, you know, that's what I said. I think what you captured in this book is that it's the stories. It's the human connection. It's not just the physical instruments. It's what makes people tick. And I think that's so exciting. I love the book, obviously, but I, I really have found that people that don't even play guitar have told me, boy, that's a fun book to read. So I know that, uh, you know, again, I'm not the author of it, so I can pitch it <laughs> as a great book, and I hope people will. You can find Willie G. Mosley's great new book, Basses and Guitars, the Huckabee Collection. You can get it at the very best booksellers, or just go to Huckabee.tv. You will find links to get the book online. I know that you're going to love it. Now, don't fret. 
I <laughs> catch that. Don't fret because more amazing guitars and basses are coming up next. And Keith Bilbrey is standing by to tell us all about it. Well, up next, Love Song joins Mike at the desk and later a special performance by Love Song. That's ahead on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee bugs, t-shirts and more Many of us remember the late 60s and the unprecedented spiritual awakening that was to become the Jesus Revolution. Soon after, in 1970, some young musician hippies walked into a little church in Southern California with their guitars. They went there to audition for the pastor. The band was called Love Song, and they would help pioneer a whole new genre of music. With a groundbreaking release in 1972, Love Song would be part of what became known as the Christian Woodstock event called Expo 72. I was there and it changed my life, along with the lives of thousands of others who were a part of that incredible experience. Well, this spring, the big spring movie, Jesus Revolution, featured Love Song with their cutting edge music. The band is now in the middle of producing an incredible documentary about the movement and the music that inspired an entire generation. Would you please welcome Chuck, Tommy, and Jay, the band Love Song. <laughs> Chuck, at Expo 72, you guys were on the stage. I was in the nosebleed section of the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, and I never thought I would actually meet you in person and have the opportunity to perform with you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for introducing a lot of young Christians like me, young believers, that had kind of thought there was nothing for us. Yeah. And the music that you helped put together really was revolutionary. Did you have any idea of the impact it was having on kids like me? Not at the time. I mean, uh, my fav favorite line is, we were just a bunch of hippies in the right place at the right time. <laughs> we came into Calvary Chapel, we started to play. We didn't have any uh, any agenda or any knowledge about really the church that much. You know, We just wanted to communicate the Lord through our music, and we were writing these songs, and we went to see Pastor Chuck and see if he'd let us play. They had this hippie preacher that looked like Jesus named Lonnie Frisbee. <laughs> and we thought, well, we look like Crosby, Stills, and Nash or something. So uh, that'd be a good fit. And Pastor Chuck uh, invited us to play that night. And the place just kind of exploded from there. It went from 200 to about 2,000 in about four months' time. Wow. We had to put up that circus tent that's in the movie that was not white. It was actually sort of an olive drab, <laughs> military-looking tent. But uh, no, we had we we really were clueless. You know, we we just we you can only see something like that in retrospect when you look back on it. You know, but we praise God for the way He used our band and without us even really knowing it. You know, and you know, Tommy, I'm, I'm thinking you guys were all in rock and roll bands. I know Chuck played with the Hondells, and uh, all of you were in bands and rock and roll during that period of time, doo wop, and a lot of different things. But you created a genre. It wasn't that you started doing Christian music. There wasn't any Christian contemporary no. music. I remember doing, uh, a guy that we signed with a label did some research into what is gospel music, whether well, it's black gospel and southern gospel. Uh -huh. we went, well, we're neither one of those. Yeah. And so and we literally sat in the kitchen and said, I guess we'll just have to find our own way. And that's why we signed with United Artists Records, too, because there, there was no business developed to distribute this kind of thing. Nobody had a name for it yet. Yeah. You know, uh, and Jay, I'm, I'm just looking back over the years and I'm realizing that now Christian contemporary music is a huge industry. It's, it's huge. It's, uh, it's, it's a very lucrative industry. And I don't mean to say that disparagingly, but in the day, it was just some guys with guitars and drums and you were connecting to a bunch of kids. Yeah, I, I met Chuck in uh, 67 and, uh, at a nightclub. And one of the guys at the nightclub... Uh, they had met Chuck in Vegas, and he came back, and he was, uh, he grabbed me and took me outside and said, hey, you got to know Jesus, you know. Huh. So I, I got kind of like 
saved at this nightclub back in 67. So Not we, a lot of people were getting saved in nightclubs. And, and then, you know. well, no, no, here's the deal. We, were, we had Bible studies on Tuesday nights. At really? Night. Yes. And it was, we were all hippie musicians. We, I mean, we didn't even think about going to church. I was living in Hawaii uh, eventually, and uh, I tried to go to a church there. They wouldn't even let me in because <laughs> I, I kind of looked like the castaway guy. <laughs> In fact, my mom did. When I got home, my mom walked by me three times and didn't even recognize me. But uh, so I was there just with my Bible, just trying, you know, I, I'm a surfer, old surfer, but I wasn't really even surfing. I just was kind of walking, you know, I just wanted to walk with God, you know, just kind of just check out for a while. In fact, about, there would have been a monastery or, in fact, I wanted to go to that little island called Nihil over there where the people live like, you know, they did 100 years ago. So, you know, I think what's fascinating is that there was a, the counterculture, which was clearly the hippie movement, and people were uh, just trying to break away from what they were so frustrated with. They, they saw life, and it was just uh, phony, and they, they just said none of that. And then they realized that the hippie movement itself had an emptiness. It was not yeah. fulfilling. Yeah. And then God gets introduced in that, and suddenly it was transformational. Well, that, changed that's, everything. that's a key point, really, because what started out for me was that I thought the drug experience was part of the God experience. Mm. And so my friends and I, that some Tommy was in the little clique of believers for, for a season, and uh, all of a sudden we came to this place where, like, we need to connect with God without the drugs, and we don't know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We hadn't really found that place yet. And so that was like the next level was to find out how can I have this experience but not needing the drug to get me there. And, and we were not looking at church at all. Yeah. I mean, church was just by accident. Someone came and told us about this church in Costa Mesa that where there was a hippie preacher and there was all these long-haired kids. And we go, you got to be kidding us. I mean, you know, so we, we all went down there and checked it out. So we were there for a couple of weeks before we asked the pastor yeah. if we could share some music. But I think it's important that discipleship is kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Somebody came back whose life was changed, and she didn't make a big deal of it. She said, yeah. my life is different every day now since I met Jesus. Uh. And she came to show care, and she told us, you guys have to check that out. That's, and I think that's the way discipleship works. One person tells somebody else, and it's real, and you see it. It is such a powerful story. And when we come back, I'm going to be talking more with Love Song and... Before the show is over, they're going to perform one of their classic songs, Don't You Dare Go Away. We will be right back with Love Song. Texas Congressman Pat Fallon and the sweet country sound of Melanie Cannon. And welcome back. I'm talking about the band that virtually invented contemporary Christian music, Love Song. Where did the name come from, Love Song? I was in Las Vegas when Jay was talking about earlier meeting me in Las Vegas and uh, there was a guy came to visit us. We were all in the LSD season of our lives. And he just said, um, I've thought of the great name for a band in this season. This was not a Christian band, but yeah. a hippie band, The Love Song. And mm. that stuck in my mind and I never forgot it. And when we came to the place where we needed a name for our band, I remembered that. And of course, by this time, The was outdated. You don't say The this, you say. So we just took the The off and call ourselves Love Song. You know, we thought about, uh, should we have a more gospel sounding name? But we, didn't, we weren't really about that. You know, we were yeah. about something new, new and different. And so we thought, well, this name fits. We're about, like they say in the movie, that guy that's supposed to play me, he says, hey, we're a love song. Because we sing songs about God's love, God's love, you know. And it's kind of like that. It's about, it's music about God. It's that simple. Jesus music. You know, I, I'm struck by the fact that had Chuck Smith, that pastor, who, who was at that time, in a very traditional kind of church. If he'd have looked at all these guys coming in and said, I don't want to use people in my church, right. this never would have happened. Yeah. It happened because there was a man who was willing to accept people that didn't look like his congregation, didn't talk like his congregation, didn't act like his congregation, and he loved them, yeah. and it transformed 
the Christian ministry across the world. Not everybody was like that. It had a lot to do with his wife, Kay, mm. who would sit on Pacific Coast Highway watching his hippies go by. She'd be crying and saying, Chuck, there's got to be a way to reach these kids. And he said, all those dirty, those dirty hippies just need to get a job and get a bath. And she'd go, Chuck, don't say that. And the Holy Spirit, you know, as you went across the country, you didn't get that kind of reception everywhere. Yeah. I can't wait till this documentary comes out this fall. I'm very excited about it because it's all about this love song story. And it's going to be a great kind of connecting point for many of us who went through that era. Chuck, you've written a book called Rock and Roll Preacher, From Doo-Wop to Jesus Rock, all your story. I mean, there's a whole lot to connect to. And really, I pray and hope that the audience and a lot of our audience grew up through that era they know love song. They know the songs. I've often said the song Two Hands is like, for me, the anthem of Christian contemporary music. The lyrics, it's just such a powerful Amen. anthem. It's not just a song. And I thank you for what you have done for me personally and for thousands and millions of young believers across this world who were touched, who wouldn't have listened to a sermon, but they listened to a song love song. God bless you. Well, Keith, while the band gets ready to play, we're going to let you tell the viewers how they can get more of the fantastic music of love song and learn more about the documentary coming out this fall. To find all their music, videos, and more, and to help support the upcoming documentary, a band called Love Song, just visit Huckabee.tv. Now, performing their classic song, Since I Opened Up the Door with Trey Corley and Music City Connection at Mike on Bass, here is Love Song. <laughs> Stumble, you're there to pick me up When I get thirsty, I know you'll fill the cup Since I opened up, opened up the door I can't think of anything else but you anymore Since I opened up, opened up the door Distracted, you pull me back in line. 